Good evening and welcome to the January 17th, 2019 uh, Council Infrastructure Committee meeting of the Issaquah City Council. I am Council Member Victoria Hunt and I am joined today by Council President uh, Tola Martz and Council Member Chris Ray. Um, thank you both for being here this evening. We have four items on the agenda and after each one we will take public comment if there is any comment. Um, if there is anyone from the public to comment on the issues. And the um, items that we will be discussing this evening are AB 7538, updated water system plan. This is a <coughs> action item for this evening. Um, AB 7714, amending IMC 18.22, wireless communication facilities and related fees. This is a discussion item. And AB 7715 Front Street Streetscape Phase 1 Project. This is an action item. And then we will also have project updates. So with that, we will get started. And I will hand it over to uh, Robert York, Engineering Manager. Thank you. Good evening, Council Members. Uh, Bob York, Engineering Manager, Public Works Engineering Group. Um, tonight's CIC briefing is brief by its nature. And uh, it's about the water system plan. Um, and the action requested tonight by CIC is to refer this back to the full council for adoption via resolution at, at next Tuesday's meeting. So, um, uh, very brief background. We spent a year in mostly 20, 2017 and a little bit of 2018 preparing a draft. That draft was presented to the council and referred to CIC on March 19th. Uh, in the interve intervening period, we've had four council work sessions. We've had numerous uh, other meetings, including a public hearing on the water use efficiency rule. Uh, our policy issues that we considered were water conservation or demand, water supply and, and water quality. Over those meetings, there were multiple opportunities for public engagement, including that public hearing throughout the process. We've just in the last week re received verbal confirmation with the Washington De Department of Health that the um, responses to all the comments that we've received are satisfactory from the standpoint of moving ahead. Uh, we've also done a SEPA checklist that's been submitted and we expect the, the common period to end this Friday, the 25th. So today's the 22nd and to my knowledge that we haven't received any negative comments. It's, it's a DNS, it's the preliminary determination of non-significance. And the um, very minor changes to the water system plan are part of tonight's packet that available online and I have a copy of the updated plan that, on, that I brought tonight. You won't see much other than editorial changes except there's one thing that Sheldon want, wanted me to point out. Um, Mamish Plateau Water and Sewer met with the mayor and, and uh, certain council or certain uh, other members of the city a week or a little over a week ago and expressed a, a desire to have some language changes in the, uh, in the assumption um, chapter. Uh, we included all the interlocal agreement, uh, inter interlocal agreements that have been made with Sammamish Plateau in our new appendix. This is actually uh, a mis the typo on which chapter it's in, it's chapter 3.6.2 is the language change. So what we did, and Sheldon wrote this, uh, and uh, allow people to review it is, instead of saying the city shall assume, which is what the comprehensive plan policy says, we added the verbiage or use some other method, um, all municipal and public purpose district water utilities supply direct retail, retail service in the city of Issaquah. And then in the discussion that follows that, the city's intent, new language you can read there is the city's intent is to, to provide direct re retail service to all citizens 
within its corporate boundaries. However, the city has an interlocal agreement with Mammoth Plateau Water and Sewer District that precludes until 2026 any unilateral assumption of that portion of the district inside city limits. So we thought that, Sheldon thought that change, and we thought that change was, was met the intent of what Sammamish Plateau wanted while still preserving our policy that we have in our comprehensive plan. Questions on that? So what what is it that Sammamish Plateau wanted? Wasn't clear to me when you were well, describing um, that what they said they wanted. Uh, there's a, before I got here, I should admit, there was a history of, of different differences of opinion on various things between us and Sammamish Plateau. One was that we uh, had a, a groundwater infiltration or a stormwater infiltration gallery that they were concerned with um, in terms of their water quality at their wells. The second thing is we had this policy a long -going, on an ongoing basis and I think the city initiated activities to uh, uh, begin the uh, uh, studies of regarding assumption of the water and sewer infrastructure in our inside our city limits. That was all created litigation and interlocal agreements solved this combination of issues, including us um, disabling the infiltration gallery and also this assumption with a this assumption the ILA stipulated in an amendment to the original ILA that we wouldn't pursue any unilateral assumption discussions until 2026. So um, they wanted to clarify that in the 10 year time frame of this water system plan that 2026 will be in the, in the 10 year horizon. Uh, so uh, Sheldon thought this combination of adding these words that specifies we, we can look at options to still meet the criteria for policy and while satisfying Sammamish Plateau's concern not to lose part of their, you know, they're in the water and sewer business, so if they lose the part in Issaquah, well, that's probably significant in their, in their, uh, a significant concern of theirs. Thank you. So I think that's the. Got it. Um, so going back to trying to be brief, uh, if CIC agrees tonight, we'd be adopting the water system plan via resolution. I'd be updating the agenda bill and adding dates to the resolution tomorrow for to be added to your council packet that you'll get later to, uh, on Friday. Uh, we'll expect the final SEPA DNS to occur a, a week from tomorrow. Um, then once council is acted to adopt the water system plan, we'll send it to Washington Department of Health and King County to, for final approval from their standpoint. Then as you might recall, post water system plan, we've received your direction to begin various things like a rate study to understand the implications of some of the projects we're envisioning. Uh, the fluoride considerations, I will be starting as soon as I can get this aspect done on a new focus. And then um, very early water planning work to evaluate our water planning and treatment uh, blending considerations, which with my colleague Tony, we're already talking about how that will affect our future water service area. So you have, in wrapping this up, you have various alternatives. Refer back to the council for approval next Tuesday, which is next council meeting. Continue to evaluate in the committee if you have concerns. Uh, you can not recommend approval or you can recommend a approval at a later council meeting. Uh, but uh, our recommendation is that you move ahead for next Tuesday and, and go ahead and adopt the water system plan per resolution. Thanks. Thank you. Council President Martz. Um, I have a question, which is this is sort of a, in some sense, is a weird bill because it isn't a direct authorization for expenditure, but it is nonetheless direction on a very large amount of money mm -hmm. to be spent over the next umpteen years. So 
but one of the things that I would like to ask is that, or, or see if it's possible to have the language of the bill include sort of a summary of this preferred option, sort of what the financial outlay would be as a result of choosing this option going forward. I mean, council definitely gave guidance. It had three or four options in front of it. You know, they, they are proceeding with the option that we said as a group that you sense of the body wanted, but that information is in this bill, but it's uh, in this packet, but it's sort of buried and, and contained in various places. And I would like to see a paragraph or two, if we could, that would sort of summarize it at the top. Is that, is that reasonable? Um, well, so, and make sure, I, I wanna make sure that I correctly summarize, but um, so would it be possible then when this comes back to the full council to have that information um, pulled out for the financial implications of the option that's being considered long term. As you might recall, we didn't do a rate study which has so mm -hmm. many variables, but we do. We couldn't summarize the the amount of money anticipated to be spent. And we can do a couple paragraphs, and what we usually do is an update to the agenda bill that was issued a year ago, almost a year ago. Mm -hmm. So I could suppose, try to get that done by tomorrow morning, and then you can deliberate on that, and if it's on consent, you can have the option of pulling it off consent if it's not meeting your expectations. I think there was a, wasn't there, a, there was a conversation at leadership this week about whether this one should be on consent or not, I believe, um, and the conversation was around it being such a major piece of public policy. Um, I, 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 think, I think the conversation was that it was, uh, well, it's up to this committee to choose what it wants to do. Um, well, are, do you have any questions? No. Okay. Um, so I had, a, I had one question. I um, am familiar with this document after having many, many touches, but I still see interesting new things when I look at it. Um, and so one of them is about that the water, um, the groundwater is blended for the highlands and talus currently. And so I, um, I wondered, because the proposed way forward for the city includes more areas to have blended water, I wondered if the characteristics of the water that's blended um, in Talus and uh, the Highlands would be a sort of example for the, for that kind of blending that would would actually, be expanded in the future. Actually, the water in the Highlands is all regional water. It's not okay. blended. It can be blended. There's a blending facility, but it's never used. And the water in Talus has gone back and forth, but it's either one or the other. Right now, it's groundwater uh, up till March of last year. For several years after the landslide, it was uh, regional water. So we, had, we don't actually blend anywhere in the city intentionally. On an emergency basis, we could, but uh, if some major is issue occurred, we can blend the water, but we're not blending the water as a matter of, uh, of practice. And my colleague Tony's sitting there with all this knowledge, making sure I'm saying everything correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I did notice in the water, and I'll just to clarify my question, I did notice in the water system plan that it says under 2.4.2 purchase water supply, um, it says regional water from the transmission main is blended with the city groundwater to serve the Issaquah Highlands development. It can be. As, as a, we have the facilities to do it, but we don't do it as really what should have said. Hmm. Oh, that's a that's a, okay. a rat, that's an, a rat item in the water system plan. I can uh, modify. Okay, um, I guess it's an error then. I think so. Go Errata. Okay. Tony, if you're going to talk, uh, come on up. Is it you're on you're on TV? <laughs> so so we did that um, before, but we no longer did not uh, okay. plan the water. We did plan water a few years ago. We still can, but we don't. And so it should say we either have a capability to do it or we have done it and we don't. But I'm glad you caught that because of all the times I've read it, I read right through <laughs> it. Um. 
So we can clarify that in, in, the, in what you'll see coming to council. Okay. Um, okay, then I guess I'll, I'll, I'm still interested in the answer to my question, which be, would be that, so we have previously blended and we do have the capacity to blend for talus. So would the, the blending that would occur on an expanded basis throughout the city going forward as we see the proportion of the city that can be, um, that can be on groundwater, um, that the groundwater will be mixed more with regional water. Will that, will those characteristics be similar to what was previously with the blended water? Or would it be a different sort of um, system? The way the <clears throat> blending occurs or the way we run the system even now without blending balances the water quality from certain wells with other wells to make sure we're within the stipulated parameters. So the blending that we might have done in the past must have been done in accordance with the, all the Department of Health requirements at the time. Now there's more concern about, well, fluoride variability, chlorine, make sure, making sure we have enough chlorine in the combined blended water and all the, uh, remember the, some of the parameters we're concerned about, like pH and arsenic and, uh, and manganese. So those are things that <clears throat> um, are not optimal for blending and our groundwater mixed with regional water right now. So that's why the blending and the treatment are, have, have, have to happen as a, uh, before we would be confident that the blended water wouldn't have any water quality implications either on our distribution system or, or at, at our customer taps. For example, low pH can, pH if not adjusted properly can lead to lead and, lead and copper issues. Mm -hmm. Michigan is the extreme example of that, but we, were, we don't have that problem to that extent, but that's the kind of thing you always have to worry about in terms of serving your water to your customers. Same thing with the PFOS. We want to make sure our wells are treated to the level which is still in flux. It's tending to go down about the PFAA, PFASs. So, did I help answer your question? It's, yes. I think the right way to blend is to do more than just blend our raw water from the wells with or our partially treated water with the wells to with our incoming water from the, see, the uh, toll system. SPU Cascade Water Alliance. Mm -hmm. I actually have a question for President Martz, and, and it really deals with, um, I want to talk about um, consent versus regular business, and I'm, I'm just thinking that we have seen this um, several times as, as a full, full body, and we have given direction in terms of where we want to go in terms of a treatment facility. Um, so is there something kind of new that would be coming forward? Or just kind of trying to understand where the thinking. So we've seen it in uh, work session. We haven't seen it in uh, uh, a regular business meeting. Uh, I just think it's committing us to a very large sum of money over a very long amount of time. and it. To me, anything that, uh, you know, of a, of a certain size, I just would like to see in, in regular business. And, um, I also think that in general, um, on whether to have things on consent or regular business, I mean, you know, I think if any of the seven of us want something to be on regular, it should, it should be on regular. Um, I think the staff has done a, a ton of work on this. I, I realize that the council has seen it a bunch, but the public, unless they're following the uh, work sessions, and some, and some do not, amazingly enough. Uh, I think it can go quickly, too. I don't think it has to be a, a long conversation, but I, I think it should be regular, just because of the just because the magnitude of the dollars involved. Great, and I agree with you. I think if anybody wants it, it should be. It has to be. And I assume I t if it's going to on regular business, you'd want a very brief presentation of a similar nature that I delivered or we delivered tonight. And I'll just add to that, I don't think it has to, I mean, the presentation to the full council wouldn't necessarily have to be the changes since the last time this body has seen the document. It could just be two slides that are like, you know, here's what the next 20 years, here's the, here's the demand, 
here's the plan, here's the money. Um, and then I think also to echo the earlier point, we would like the financial implications pulled out, emphasized, probably also emphasized for the um, for the presentation of the materials. Is that correct? Well, I, I, I certainly would like to see them in the in the in the the bill. body of the bill, mm -hmm. and probably if you're going to put up two slides or three slides, it should probably the total amount should be there too. I mean, time and money, right? It's it's umpteen years at umpteen dollars is what I would suggest. <clears throat> that portion of the agenda bill where there's an update, which is usually the only thing we try to change is an opportunity to add a paragraph or two on that. Followed by if it does go back on regular business, a slide or two, so. Okay, um, so this is a action item for this evening. Um, do we have any discussion before we're ready to make an action? Public comment? Is there anybody from the public here? There's no one from the public. Um, so I, I wanted to make um, a few comments. The first one is, I think, um, so thank you for the presentation and for all of the work of all of the staff that were involved. And um, I think it is a very comprehensive document. One part that is of interest to me is the conservation, um, the water conservation piece. And I think um, the, we set targets, but that doesn't mean that people can't exceed those targets. And we have seen um, that the community is conserving more and more water. And also um, that's probably helped along by technologies that use less water, um, utilities that use less water. So um, the, the, con the water conservation um, is an interesting part of this to me, and I think we can probably always be increasing and in, always doing better in terms of conserving water. Um, I am interested in, in the next steps part. I'm really interested in the fluoride conversation. Um, I think that that'll be coming up soon, and I'm interested in talking about the community benefits in terms of um, dental health and prevention of cavities and the benefits that um, come along and all of the science behind that issue. So I'm looking forward to that. And um, and then other than that, I think we have some, some policy decisions, but definitely this sets us down a path. And so um, I, I would agree that bringing this before the full council would be, would be beneficial to have one last opportunity for council to, to review um, because it does set us down a path and then we'll make more specific decisions as we go. So President Martz. Uh, I'm, I'm also in support of this bill. My council member Ray was kind enough to point out to me the section where it says 61 million over 20 years, uh, which is good. Um, I would ask, um, uh, I think we want to make sure that it says someplace, and I, I can't find it right this second, but making sure that it says where the money is intended to come from on this. This isn't a general fund. Uh, issues. So, uh, you know, just mentioning, just reiterating that with council uh, that this is coming out of dedicated funds uh, would be good. But uh, I am in support. Yeah, I think I think that um, the staff and our consultants have done a spectacular job on the water system plan, and I agree with uh, Council President Martz about uh, highlighting this for source of funding. And then, Bob, as you pointed out, one of your tasks for this coming year is the rate study, which will will reflect the the long term implications of the water treatment facility, right? Yes, and Sheldon wants us to do it in a a, a fashion that provides a continuum of different trade offs rather than just a recommendation. So I think those of you that have a, a quantitative um, 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 uh, want to see things quantitatively, you're going to be, uh, hopefully be impressed with what I'm trying to pull off. Uh, we'll hire a consultant to augment that skill set because that involves all sorts of uh, understanding of the rules reflecting finance, financing of public utilities. Uh, it's, by the way, another thing is it's 
water, sewer, and storm, not just water. So we'll be looking at all the all the uh, utilities and uh, in terms of the rates that we see in the future. Thank you. Um, so the administration's recommendation is to approve the proposed resolution adopting the 2018 water system plan. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, and I th our recommendation would be to have this go forward on the regular agenda rather than on okay, consent. Okay, no. Have a presentation ready and also reflect what you've asked in the updated agenda bill. Thank you very much. Our next item is AB 7714, amending IMC 18.22, wireless communication facilities and related fees, presented by Keith Niven, Economic and Development Services Director. I shut my presentation. Uh, this will be just a second, sorry. Um, um, good evening, Acting Chair Hunt. Substitute members Ray and Martz. <laughs> wow, this is a bunch. <laughs> um, Keith Niven, Development Services Director, Economic Development Director. Um, so, uh, coming to you this evening with Agenda Bill 7714. And uh, before I start, um, I'm going to just grouse a little bit. Um, so, when we when we adopt code, um, I generally don't like to bring it back in less than a year to amend it. Um, we adopted the new code for wireless communication facilities for the city less than a year ago. Um, and, but here we are. Uh, and we are here uh, because of uh, an FCC order related to um, the siting of wireless communication facilities. Um, the second reason I'm going to grouse is I generally don't like to bring code amendments forward that I don't think make our community better. Um, I don't think these will make our community better. I think we did that a year ago. So now that I've gotten that off my chest, um, uh, Daniel Kenny from Ogden Murphy Wallace is also here this evening. Um, so there is uh, pending litigation uh, that many cities have brought against the FCC order. Um, and if you guys want to dive deep into asking questions about that, um, I'm going to definitely defer to Daniel on that. Um, I included as the first slide uh, in my presentation, uh, it's an op-ed from the mayor of San Jose. Um, and the reason why I included this, and it was published in the New York Times, uh, the reason why I included this for you guys to just, and I'm not gonna read it, um, is to just give you a sense of why cities are unhappy with uh, the FCC order. And I thought that uh, this paragraph did a good job in kind of just summarizing some of the points of why um, there are so many cities that are trying to uh, first get a stay, and unfortunately, the, the stay was denied. Um, and so that meant that the FCC order was uh, actually went into effect this month, um, which is why we're here, um, trying to amend our code to uh, potentially stay out of trouble. Um, so the... Um, the, the red line of the code is included in your packet. Uh, there's a lot of changes, but what I wanted to do was kind of specifically talk about a few um, and, and how they, um, why they're included and uh, you know, what's being changed and, and, and maybe how the administration is feeling about it. So, so the way we structured our code was basically to identify uh, areas where we were encouraging new small cell facilities uh, and macro facilities to, to that extent. So uh, section uh, 18, chapter 1822 is both small cell wireless communication devices as well as macro towers. Um, and so we created siting criteria where we identified areas where we thought that they should go, um, areas where we discourage them to go, but they could still be allowed there for, uh, for technical reasons, and then areas that we identified as prohibited. Um, and Front Street was an example of an area we considered prohibited. One of the things that came out of the FCC order was um, basically a, a 
declaring that we can't prohibit. Um, so what Daniel and I talked about was, okay, well, let's create a deviation section. So rather than unwind our encourage, discourage, prohibit, because we still like that structure, um, let's create now basically like a variance opportunity. So if you, if, if they come to us and say the prohibited and discouraged sections don't work for them, and the only thing that works is to put it in a prohibited location, and they can provide the technical uh, backing to support that, um, there's now a proposed provision in the code that would allow a process to go forward and the siting of a new wireless facility or macro tower in a prohibited location. The second one is dealt with fees. The FCC um, said, uh, here's how much you can charge. Um, and uh, our fees were significantly more than that. Um, and this is one of the pieces where we have, I think, a little bit of flexibility. Uh, my understanding is what the FCC said is unless, you know, that, the, that they said, you know, we're not trying to give them a gift, but if, you're, if you can't demonstrate your cost to issue permit, to do permit review and inspections, then here's the maximum that you can charge. So Council Member Hunt and I talked about this a little bit earlier in the month, and one of the questions that was asked is, well, could staff go to time and materials, uh, basically track our time, um, and uh, basically charge them what it costs us to issue the permits and do the inspection? Um, so I talked about that with my staff um, and the software that we have right now to do permit review. Um, and the, the response back I got was, yes, we can do that, um, as long as we're limiting it to something like cellular, small cells or macro towers. If it's all permits, um, we're gonna have an administrative um, explosion within development services. And, and so as long as we're kind of confining it potentially to wireless facilities, uh, we, we have the ability to do that. So that's. That's something we can talk about um, when I get through this. The third one on my list was um, we have a section called consolidated permits where we said, you know what, it, it, it's probably unreasonable for us to say every antenna needs to be on its own permit. And so we said you could do 10. Do 10, uh, maybe it's all 10 on Gilman um, and we'll do that as one permit which would allow, you know, ease of administration, ease of their application process. That seemed like a, a reasonable number. Um, the FCC said that they could submit one permit for the whole city. Um, so that could be fun <laughs> because it also then folds into the next one which is, um, they basically decrease the amount of time they're giving us to do the permit review. Um, so a level one is basically an antenna on an existing structure, and a level two is a new pole. Um, so we're, we're going from 75 to 60 and from 120 to 90, plus when the clock starts, actually it starts a lot earlier under the FCC rule. So not only did the, the timeline get shorter, but it starts a lot earlier in the process. Um, so that one's kind of a little bit of a, a double dip. Um, and then the last one that I wanted to bring your attention to uh, was the, we talked a lot about the, the visual impact of these things. Because um, basically you've got an antenna, but then you got a box of electrical equipment that, that runs the antenna, right? And um, you know, prior to uh, the FCC order, uh, that box was limited to 17 square feet, cubic feet, thank you. Um, and now it's uh, 28. Um, so the equipment box has got a lot bigger, apparently. So all of this was done under the auspices of facilitating the deployment of 5G. Um, and so that was why the FCC said we needed to make these changes to allow ourselves and our communities to be, um, to have the highest tech uh, possible. So that's, that's, that's where we're at. Now, so we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, 
This is just informational tonight. It's to queue up a conversation to see what things you guys might want some more information on. I have not gone to the Planning Policy Commission yet. That's next week. Um, we will go there next week. We'll have a hearing. Uh, we'll take testimony. It may uh, result in some other edits to the proposed draft uh, ordinance changes. And then we'll be back here in February to kind of hopefully finish up this conversation. So with that, I'm done talking. Council President Martz? No, oh, okay. I wasn't. Um, Council Member Ray. All sorts of questions for you here. <laughs> um, so just to make sure I got this right, so the FCC's ruling was under the auspices of ex um, expediting the deployment and adoption of, of 5G uh, LTE service, right? Yes. Um, how many cell sites, small and macro sites, I think was the word you used, um, are we anticipating are going to be inside the city limits in the next 12 months? Uh, super great question. Um, you know, and, and I would have loved to have road tested our, or, our code before we had to change it. Um, we have gotten none um, in the last eight months, nine months that this code's been in place. Um, just at infrastructure last month was uh, franchise agreements for um, AT&T and Verizon. So, so the franchise agreements are, are moving along um, and, you know, but we have not, nobody has come to the permit center and said, hey, we're getting ready to submit applications for small cell deployment. I have no idea. I mean, it's, you know, the last 12 months has, or almost 12 months has been crickets. I, it could very well be the next 12 months might, we might not get anything or we might, you know, Verizon might show up with a citywide deployment, um, you know, next month. I don't know is the answer. Do we have any kind of um, connection into the, the carriers so that there's some kind of forewarning about when things are going to happen? Um, Even at some sort of conceptual level, like we're, we've got you guys targeted for 2028 or something. I'll let Daniel, I know Daniel and Alana Zana from Ogden Murphy Wallace have more frequent conversations about deployment and Daniel might be able to help with that. Uh, or not help a whole, a whole lot. Um, that, that question obviously gets asked all the time to try to understand, you know, what does this look like for our community? And to be quite frank, the people that we're working with are kind of a policy citing, citing uh arm of what's going on. The technology is still de still developing, the needs are still developing, so they're not gonna be able to say that. What we do have is a good working relationship with the individuals that are working on codes and siting and getting the franchises. And so, for example, I think one of the reasons why um, you haven't seen a whole lot of um, industry approaching cities for during the period when this FCC order and right before is because they understood that there was a process um, and um, obviously we don't agree with what the FCC did and the position that industry has taken broadly, but um, I think if um, staff, Keith, reached out to some of the contacts um, with, uh, at the industry with the different carriers, you may get a heads up that we're thinking about coming your way. They're never gonna say, this is what it's gonna look like in five years or much beyond that. Okay. So, oh, and then Keith, I think the last question is really for you, and it deals with um, fees and, and then the comments you made around if we track our time, then we can recover the cost of permitting. Yep. Um, do you have a sense of what the cost of permitting would be for um, a small cell site or a, a group of 10 or um, a citywide one? I mean, it seems kind of, is this is for per site though, the fee, right? That's not per permit. Per permit. Five, $500 per permit? Yes. So if we did a citywide permit, we would permit the entire city for $500. Which is about three hours worth of staff work. You guys are good. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm losing money is what I'm doing. Okay. Um, 
You can clarify. Okay, and, I, I, and I want to make sure that we have this in there too. Is it's five hundred dollars for the first permit for five sites, and then it's a hundred dollars each additional site. Oh. So, uh, and, and the reason I bring that up and is, is a site an, an antenna. Yeah. Okay. So the reason I bring that up is because if if you maxed out your current permit with ten, five of those would be five hundred bucks. The next five would be a hundred each. That's a thousand dollars. So you would actually be close to the twelve hundred dollars uh, that you would be paying for that. That's assuming they max out. Um, and by no means do I want to imply that the additional hundred dollars covers your staff's time because I don't think it will. I think it is low. Um, however, th that's how that works. And so if they have something that is very broad and citywide, there could be upwards of multiple thousands of dollars coming in for that review. Again, still a lot of work and a lot of time would go into it. And I'm more concerned about the second part of that. So the new structures. So Daniel, does the, uh, does the new structures work the same way? Just, that's just one for a new structure. $1,000 for one new structure. It is not a up to the first anything. No, no package deal there? No. Yeah, so. Um, so what's the question then, because um, after tonight, after our update, you're taking this to PPC next week, what's the question for PPC to address? So PPC will make a recommendation on adoption of the modified code. So we'll make a presentation at PPC and the administration's recommendation is to, uh, rec the administration's recommendation would be for PPC to recommend approval of the modifications to the code. And the modifications to the code essentially make a snap to uh, the FCC's guidelines. I'm looking to Daniel to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the goal. Okay. Um, you know, it's, it's funny because Keith mentioned this earlier. Everybody, and I, every city in the U.S. was trying to deal with the oncoming small cell. You guys dealt with it great, had a lot of process and got there um, so that when it really started to roll out, you had it in place. And then the FCC said, hey, we're going to get involved and make sure that everybody does this the way we want them to do it. Uh, if you'll recall, there was state legislative action that was pending and being talked about while you guys were preparing uh, your prior code. And so the states essentially were forced to back off because the FCC stepped in. So um, we're, we're going to get there, but n no other city has been there, had it tested. Nobody's had a code, had multiple applications. This is how it works. There isn't litigation on these codes. So we're, we're, we're getting to where the FCC is based upon their order, and uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Thank you. Council President Mertz. I think that was a maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so we spent some time last year talking about tower height. Yes, we did. And uh, one of the council members was enthusiastic enough to do some drone flying uh, <laughs> to illustrate those heights. I vaguely remember that. Uh, does anything here change uh, those elements? Uh, let me quickly leaf through. I don't believe uh, that there was any mandate on pole heights. The pole heights for small cell, there was, um, but I think you guys had already covered that with the adoption of the initial code language. Uh, and just to be clear, so we did, there, there were some pieces. So if you remember, we had this little simple diagram of a new pole. And part of the conversation we had when we adopted this code was we have so many different poles in town to try and figure out how to, to write design guidelines that would work everywhere. We basically uh, said that it will be at the discretion of the city, but here's an example. So that it wasn't completely ambiguous. There was at least uh, something that the providers could rest their hat on and say, look, you put this in your code, I wanna build that pole, and the answer should be yes. Um, one of the things that came out of the FCC order, and we didn't propose a code change related to it, was the FCC said, I don't want cities to have this discretionary authority over design so that the providers can't figure out what these things look like. So we did not make changes related to that because we felt like we at least had a peg for our hat to sit on. It may not be a great one, but we decided let's leave it the way it is because we kind of debated that a bit before. Thank you. 
Um, so my first question is, this is all uh, for 5G, but I'm wondering if it's possible for the companies, um, but 5G is not here yet, so I'm wondering if, if they um, would be able to put in the existing technology using these regulations, or if they can only put, they can only apply this to 5G. Good question. Um, I think the first thing I'll say, just because I read the article a day or two ago, is there are a lot of claims about what 5G is and when it will be rolled out. Um, they're all trying to be first to 5G by claiming something that they have is 5G. 5G is, in reality, my understanding, at least a year or two out. So there are, there are AT&Ts claiming 5G all over the place. <laughs> the, the, they're going to listen to this. That's great. Um, the, uh, it's a big televised nationally. Yeah, yeah, nationally. <laughs> Darn it. Um, the, uh, the infrastructure can be used for both. Or, and, and right now, the reason they're coming in for their franchises right now to roll out is not to use it for 5G. It's to use the technology with current uh, systems to fill in um, basically for uh, a depth of coverage in certain areas. So uh, it'll be used in the short term for what they have now, and then when small cell uh, and 5G, or 5G using the small cells, it'll convert to that. And that's why, when I know I was here for the, the, the first franchise, the first Verizon franchise, and there, there is definitely two horizons for it, and particularly, you know, the life of a code or of a franchise is gonna cover both phases of that. Okay, so do I understand then that there's gonna be an antenna and the equipment, and they can, they can convert, as you said, from the technology that they put in to the to 5G. Yes, and, and there's different ways that they can do that. Maintenance and repair, if it's smaller, and then there's uh, in your code is eligible facilities requests where they can make modifications within a certain box, uh, certain scope, um, without the need for any any sort of uh, detailed review. So yes, they will be able to do that, and that is their long-term goal. Would it be possible to have, just in, in considering our options, would it be possible to have the more restrictive, um, so prohibiting on Front Street until it is actually 5G because it is supposedly for um, 5G? Interesting. Um, so, uh, I, n no, I don't think so, because okay. the FCC order speaks to small wireless facilities. It does not speak to the output from those facilities. Even though they said they made the decision for the deployment of 5G. Which was my hesitation. Yeah. Because the, 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 whole, the whole point here is um, this is becoming essentially uh, a necessary service or an essential service. Um, so they're trying to prepare the communities for it. So I think the preparation, even if the technology is a little ways down the line, needs to happen now. Um, when we talked about the earlier version of the code, we talked about how um, how if they if the uh, company wanted to put in a one of the discouraged types of facilities or a, a facility in a discouraged location, they would have to provide the city with some um, explanation for why it had to be there and couldn't be in a, in a encouraged place. Um, does, do they still have to provide that or does that change with the level of the, um, the level of the permitting? So the way I read the code, the way we've got it drafted now, is that part of the structure stays the same. So, so they have to go to encouraged. If that doesn't work, then they can go to discouraged, um, but they have to provide a technical analysis to show that they couldn't make the encouraged piece work. And then if they also can't make the discouraged piece work, they, they would have to go give us a technical analysis to show why both the discouraged and the encouraged doesn't work for them to get the deviation. Does that make sense? So it ends up being a double, you have to do a double test to actually get to that third tier. Okay, thank you. Um, and my last question, I think, oh, no, I have two more. Um, so my second to last question about the 28, the 17 cubic feet to 28 cubic feet. When we've seen pictures of these, they look really small and unintrusive and um, 
and like they would kind of blend in from the pictures that have been provided to us previously by the various companies. Um, and so I'm still trying, I'm still struggling to see what 28 cubic feet looks like. So I'm wondering, do, are those pictures that we've seen previously, do we know what the, the new equipment will look like or? Well, so, so I would say that that's the FCC putting a number on it. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that they will be 28 cubic feet. 28 cubic feet also is inclusive of everything instead of simply the box that it was before. So that was one difference. They're trying to say all the stuff that you're putting out there will fit within this. It doesn't mean that it's going to be a refrigerator. Um, that's up there at 28 cubic feet. That, that's not what it means. It's saying let's add up everything that you're going to put out there so it can still be broken apart and whatnot. Um, I, I would say I, I don't know the exact cubic foot measurements for what I have seen in pictures, but I do know that they are significantly less than that. So far. <laughs> President Mertz? I'll just point out that uh, three by three by three is 27. It gives a rough idea, right? So roughly a cubic yard. So mini, mini. It's, a, it's a beer fridge. Yeah, it's a beer fridge. <laughs> um, so it's a mini fridge, but but you're saying it probably isn't all right. so it, on, in on view, a pole. That would be things like the conduit, the switch, the box. Um, it's going to be more than just one location, probably. Okay. Um, I think of a beer fridge as two by two by two. I think of a dishwasher as like three by three by three. I get a bigger beer fridge. <laughs> Clearly, I was doing something wrong. <laughs> so seven, 17 is two and a half by two and a half by two and a half. So it's not, it's really not dramatically different. Six, Right, I think it's not, that's true, it's not dramatically different, but I think when we were looking at the 17 cubic feet, we were thinking that that looked bigger than all the pictures that we've seen, and then this is increasing it further than that, and so how does that line up with my understanding of what they, what I've been shown on polls from the various companies? So, so we can, um, before we come back, uh, try to get the providers to give us some photos showing what maybe 28 cubic feet look like? Um, I think we can ask. Or, or have them um, quantify what they do have in proposals to yeah. see what that looks like. I, I just hesitate to start them down a path mm -hmm. of looking bigger. <laughs> you know, what can we do with all that space? Um, and I would say, again, both the 17 and the um, 28, th those are from um, governmental bodies. One was the state, and that was um, through um, the environmental review. And then this is the FCC. This is not industry. Technical. Yeah. I, I'm sure they want the, the freedom for it, so they're, they're never going to say, no, we don't need that. But at the same time, this is not them saying, we're going to put out 20. None of this affects the macro hours, because it's all the small cell. No, right? so this is both. So okay. uh, the shot clocks and the permit fees um, and the potential deviations would apply to macro as well, so a tower. Right? The, f the, fee the fees would not. The fees are solely for small cell? Yeah. Small cell. Solely small cell. But the, but the deviation could yeah. be a macro tower. And the, the shot clocks as well. And if you remember, we prohibited it in residential. So, so we cannot prohibit in residential. They would need a deviation. They could, they'd need a deviation now to put it in residential. Or like, and a church uh, or a school could be that as well. Um, and then my, my last question is about, um, we have previously had a lot of discussion around um, the, that these facilities will be using the right of way and what are the options in terms of the city. Um, so we previously had a discussion around net neutrality and since 
um, now we have legal advice. I, I wondered if you could explain the city's options as far as that. And, um, and then also um, if there are if there are ways that the that there could be public benefit as the because these are going to be um, private companies that are using the right of way for their specific customers, so we've had a lot of discussion around that. I I think that um, there's it's an ongoing discussion. I wondered if you could provide your your insight. Sure. Um, well, so on the first one on net neutrality, you know, th this this came up before and. Mm -hmm. Since then, um, I, I know of at least California has adopted a net neutrality bill that has been, and just uh, there's an article that I think can be shared um, that has uh, some information on it. And they kind of went to a ceasefire uh, on, on their net neutrality. Um, there's lawsuits pending on that. So it is, you know, my position that um, the states deal with it that something on the local level, um, because the FCC has specifically preempted uh, local action on it, that, that it's not um, a fight to take up. So that's, I don't think that's, my position on that has not changed since before. Um, then the other question was extracting some sort of benefit. Is that right? Or, or Public benefit. right, what are the, if there are? You know, um, that, that's a really tough question because they, they've, uh, the FCC has gone so far as to say um, that the use of public facilities, like a public a city owned pole, is limited to $270. So they, they, are, they are going so far as to say you don't really get anything for this even being on your infrastructure. So there, there is really no mechanism that I see to um, extract some sort of further public benefit beyond what the FCC would view as they're already providing to the public by having the service and the infrastructure. Right, um, so this is a discussion item. Is there any discussion? Um, so I just wanted to comment that I, I went through the process of reviewing the code, um, both on planning policy and then on, on council. I know that there's been a lot of work on it. I think um, I would commend um, the staff for, for working through all the changes and making the changes and best anticipating, um, anticipating the need and trying to change code accordingly. Um, and I, I think the one thing it seems like that we do have option on is as far as the fees, and it seems like if if we have there, I based on our previous conversation, it's not going to be a, a huge number of permit applications probably, um, and it wouldn't be hugely disruptive to try to um, use the time clock to better quantify that. And so since we expect that that would um, that would better represent the true cost. It seems like that would be prudent. So I would, I would be interested in, in going that route on that particular um, requirement for the code change. Um, but otherwise, uh, I would be interested in seeing the pictures okay. of the devices. I think that's the biggest, I think that's the biggest um, question in my mind anyway. That's um, still looming. But thank you for the information. Further. All right, thank you. Thank you. And our next item is AB 7715 Front Street Streetscape Phase 1 Project. This is an action item. This will be presented by um, Christopher Wright, Economic Development Manager, and Tony Wen, Engineer. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. That's fine. Win.
open, right? I see it. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tap. Pop. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, I'm Tony Nguyen with uh, Bluebook Engineering, project engineer for this project. So, this project stems from we, we went uh, the, we have a project back in 2016. Uh, we went in and uh, improved the sidewalk on sidewalk and uh, and drainage on Front Street from Sunset to Otter back in 2016, and we removed some trees and and we always have a concept of in the future that we're gonna, gonna come back and install tree and street furniture. And this is the project that we propose to do this year. And with this project, we plant trees. Um, this project will be, it's a phase one between um, sunset and, and order. We will come up and trees. Um, install irrigation, a movable planter uh, screen, benches, and all street furniture. That's the furniture that it's gonna look like. Bike rack, screen. There's two locations. One is next to Edward Jones, and one is next to uh, the robot. And the tree tree gonna be um, Accolade M, and uh, the the uh, the tree in the in the planter will be uh, maple. And this um, this thing will be referred back to uh, the full council. Probably. Thank you, Councilmember Ray. Just a couple of. Can you go back to the the schematic or the 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 big picture? That one. Okay. Um, so we've got planter trees and we've got street trees. So which are which are the street trees and where are the planter trees? So. This is the big trees right here, are the street trees. Okay. The planter tree with um, with with seeding would be here, 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 right here, in front of um, one location here, in front of fisher meat, in front of the restaurant. And we're envisioning that those trees are going to be 40 to 60 feet at maturity? Yes. Okay. The street, the street, street trees. Tree, yes. And the planted tree, just maple, it's not going to grow big. Smaller. Okay. And then where, there's also this decorative screen with bench. Yes. Where are those on the map? One right, right here. Is it the raw bar? Now this is next to the Edward Jones in the parking lot. And the other one is right here. Okay, so they're really to help screen the the, park. the parking lots that are right off of Front yes. Street. Yes, sir. And so five five street trees and two planter trees is that? Or uh, my eyes aren't be, that good. That would be five. Five. Yeah, so that the planted tree gonna be gonna be like this with seeding around it. So the movable 
Blended tree with seeding would be five, yes, sir. Oh, okay. I think I'm good. Thank you. Mr. President Martz. Uh, can you explain why uh, we had intended this to come out of, uh, uh, this is going to be part of the capital improvement uh, uh, fund discussion, uh, plan, sorry, discussions, and instead, uh, there's and there's language in the bill explaining this, uh, we've moved it to coming out of general fund. And the bill? I'll do that. Bob, I need, I need help. How do I do get back to the general? I, I mean, I, I know what it says in the bill. It says, yes. due to the relatively low dollar value of phase one of this project, and in order to optimize the best planting window, council action is being requested to fund phase one without additional delay. But um, None of those things were unknown when we when we did the budget in you know whatever it was. Uh, how long ago was it now? Six weeks ago? Eight weeks ago? We approved the 2019 budget. Yes. Yeah, so we have this in 2018. We have this in 2018. The council will request to have this installed in 2018, but there's no no budget allocate for this. This yeah, in 2018. 2018, it was funding funded through debt service by combining it with other debt plan for issuance in 2018. So again, yes. it wasn't uh, in then. That's another year where it wasn't asked to come out of general fund, right? But here we are asking to have it come out of general fund, which is specifically not the direction the council gave eight weeks ago. Well, I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Martz, I'm not sure if we have that answer for you tonight, but we certainly can have that clarified uh, in the agenda bill going I, forward. I would certainly want it clarified yes. for council. Also, comment that that top picture is so red that it totally, totally <laughs> reminds me of the elevator doors opening uh, bit or uh, sequence from uh, the movie The Shining. <laughs> so noted. <laughs> Oh. Any more questions? A few, um, a few questions. One is um, the planters are movable, so um, but but they are trees. So I imagine that they're probably going to be fairly. You envision that they would move over time, or they would be pretty much stay put. So if you want to move it, we have a we can move it. It's, it's got big, it's two by six by two feet tall, mm -hmm. so it's heavy. So basically, if we want to move, we, we probably have to remove the trees, the, the soil inside, and we can move it. So it's, it, will be, it will be where it is on the map. It's I think it's physically possible to move them technically, but as, yeah. as Tony mentioned, they're large planters with large trees in them, so they would not, they would, you certainly need some, some fairly hefty equipment to move those. Um, and then, so the bike, the bike um, racks or the bike, those, uh, there are existing um, facilities to lock your bike up to along Front Street. So would these replace those or these would, those would stay and these would be additional? So we intend, originally we, we intend to have the existing state and, and put more of these in. But after the meeting on site, we were thinking just remove the existing to somewhere else and put these between um, Sunset and Order, the new one, his style. You would, you, um, do I understand then, you would reuse the ones that are there yes. that are the decorative ones to with different the location. swirl? Okay. Yes. Um, I think, uh, so one thing I think is nice about these is it's very clear what they are for. Um, so I, I liked that. Um, I had a question, um, question about the screens. One of them is by uh, the um, crawl bar and there's a business, so did, there's a business that's 
um, behind there yes. on the side. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you had talked with um, those businesses to make sure that this is something that they, that supports their, um, their business, their visibility, et cetera. Hi, I'm Christopher Wright, and we have talked to the businesses along there, and in particular, the, the Owl's Folly is the business that is on the side of Crawl Bar that that business didn't exist when this plan was drawn. And so when they're showing us the screen, uh, screen wall next to the Crawl Bar, uh, they're showing it, I think, in the plan, it's right up against the wall. But now there's a, a walkway that, that, that leads to Owl's Folly. So they are concerned about their business being blocked. And so uh, those screens are going to, they're kind of going on a, a separate track from all the rest of them, as, uh, all the rest of the, the, the features, uh, because we're going to work with the Arts Commission and Amy Dukes to, to go out uh, for local artists to design those. And so uh, Owl's Folly wants to be very much involved in that, if not the design process, the selection process. And so uh, it, it will just come down to, uh, you know, if, if we maintain the walkway, then it comes down to how um, porous or, you know, how uh, I don't know if transparent is the right word, how many openings there are in that screen. So it'll be a matter of finding something that, that looks good and provides the, the, the intent of screening vehicles, but still allows enough, uh, doesn't block the businesses. And um, ultimately, the businesses were amenable as long as, as the communication is open about what the wall looks like. Is it seems to be we all want to get a better picture of what that's going to look like. And so until we see some designs, okay. you know, we can't say for sure, but we're going to continue to work with them. Okay. Um, I know that the, that's a new business. As you mentioned, it's right. new since the plan, so I, I wanted to um, ask about that and make sure that... Yeah, we're, we'll, we'll continue to work with them. Okay. Um, and then, let's see. Oh, I had a question about, I know that um, the plan, this is a, a plan that has a history. It had a, um earlier work that was done. And it, um, so I wondered if you could also give an overview of, of the past work, the past, um, the past plan, this part of the plan, changes that were made to that, and then the future phase. I'll start. Uh, yeah, so you're right that the whole uh, streetscape plan itself went through a pretty significant public outreach and input series of, of workshops and open houses. And so the, the way we see it, we're just implementing what was, you know, uh, designed and approved before. We're not, we're trying not to stray too far from that. We don't want to either reinvent the wheel or contradict what was already shown and shared with the public. And so we are pretty close to what uh, was shown. The one, the one exception would be the, um, the, the, if you look in the plan, you'll see there's a, a large round planter with bench around it. And uh, when we, started looking at where those might be placed, we, the, the, just the footprint of those and the scale just didn't seem right on the sidewalk. Because we're thinking about uh, where we're placing these impacts to uh, either current or future outdoor seating that happens, salmon days certainly. You know, so we didn't want something too big and bulky. So we're going with a, a smaller planter than the big one that was shown there. Other than that, the, you, you, you can see, uh, we, you know, we found a local uh, company to do these, and they're pretty close to what was shown in the plan. I think like the screens and then the other furniture are gonna uh, continue up uh, north of Alder as the streetscape plan continues to move further north, um, and we'll be able to keep using these same furnishings. I think the screens, again, we're waiting to see how those are going to be designed, but we're going to want something that uh, maybe they're not all identical, but they're at least compatible as uh, at the different locations. And um, what's the timeline for the continuation of the streetscape approximately? I think that may be up to you <laughs> as much as it is us. Okay. Um. My last question was about the um, signage or, or making sure that people are aware about what what the work is going on. And um, 
You know, this is a very visible part of the city. People will notice changes. Um, and so what's the plan as far as letting people know what's coming and then letting people know that this is why this street is going to look different, have more trees, have these new yeah, furniture? Yeah, we've, we've started talking to our communications department about putting up a sign similar to the, you know, coming soon construction signs. Um, and where exactly to put that, I'm thinking maybe on the corner front sunset at the at the park there. Um, but yeah, to give people a heads up, this is what we're working on and this is coming soon. So in, in the form of a sign, uh, in addition to just the, you know, visiting each business and, and, and talking to them. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. I know that um, it is very visible, people will notice. So having some information about what's going on, I think would be great. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Okay, any? Discussion on this item, Mr. President Martz. So uh, I am going to really want to hear back as to why this needed to come out of general fund. Mm -hmm. The council takes very seriously budget deliberations, and uh, when we choose to go beyond a balanced budget, we go line by line. Uh, this appears to meet generally the criteria of things that we, uh, when we take things out of general fund. Um, it is for one-time expenses like this, but nonetheless, um, uh, I'm, I will be concerned about that, and I hope this doesn't become a trend in, uh, in things that we want to do as a city. Um, so beyond that, assuming I get a good answer on that, um, I'm going to sort of grudgingly um, support doing this. I think, we, I think we need to do it. I think we made changes to Front Street uh, anticipating doing this work. Um, that the community has come back to us and and uh, been unhappy with, and I think this will go a long way towards um, getting Front Street back to the place that the community wants. Um, but uh, I think we just have to be really, really funny right now. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna support it, but I'm not excited about the funding mechanism that uh, has been chosen to advance this bill. Thank you, Council Member Ray. I actually have two more questions. I'm sorry, I, I know we've, we moved out of questions, but um, what's the timeline for implementing? Sounds like the screen is on a different time than the trees and the other amenities. Oh, so I think the agenda bill says the construction would be within the next six months or so. Uh, I assume we're still sticking with that. And I think the, the screens would be done within that same time period as well. And then how, since those are big trees going in, how are we dealing with irrigation? and particularly on the, the movable trees? Those will need to be uh, hand watered as the, there's some planters out on Front Street now that DIA maintains and uh, we've confirmed with DIA that they will continue to maintain the, again, the standalone planters, whereas there is irrigation to the street tree wells. Okay. Um, and just to echo a little bit, um, I'm not gonna echo, I'm gonna amplify what you said. Uh, President Martz, which is um, there is a lot of interest in this in the community and um, sooner we can get this taken care of. I think that there are a lot of people who would like to see this done and done right. Um, I also uh, sh share Council President Martz's concern around the funding mechanism and uh, making sure that we are being consistent and thoughtful in how we go about funding that. So. Um, I think we have a little bit of time before this one comes back for, for further action, so it would be good if we could understand that the funding situation before we see it in February. Uh, I think um, that was good information about uh, Dia providing the um, irrigation for the trees, and that's really great, so I would like to um, say thank you to them for that. Um, so I, I'm excited about getting the trees back on Front Street. I think that um, is something that we have heard from the community change the character and that has been missed. And so um, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I think it is important. I think it's important for the um, character of the street I'm glad to hear also about all the um, work with the businesses to make sure that the changes are um, the changes are reflecting or or um, are being thought through with 
input from the businesses. And I think particularly because the screens are screening the businesses from the street, um, just I would, I would like to make sure that uh, the businesses stay in, in uh, communication about that because that obviously affects how they're doing business. Um, and then as far as the, um, as far as the funding mechanism, we don't, the alternative that's given is do not authorize funding. It, it seems that there would be another alternative might be that we have a conversation, a separate conversation around funding through, through the larger capital, um, capital fund unfunded conversation. Um, so that's not listed as an alternative, but we could conceivably come up with that as an alternative. Yeah, it's going to depend on what the answer is on why they wanted to move to this point, right? If you can't do it without going this way, or if there's, I just don't, without knowing the answer to that question, you, you're right, there may be another alternative. Okay. Um, so I, my impression is that we don't have the complete answer to that tonight. Um, so in that case. I, I don't have the complete answer to that tonight. I apologize, but we will have that answer to you as a, as a response to the, this work tonight, and you'll see that and, um, when that goes to full council, and, and that will uh, be the information you need or, or will, uh, or will uh, lead to further conversation, I assume. But we will specifically answer um, your questions about why this uh, is proposed to come from the general fund. Absolutely. Um, so how, how would we like to proceed? I, well, so I, I'll just speak for me. Um, I think that it is appropriate to move this forward to the full council. Um, I personally am not particularly excited about giving it a, um, an endorsement or a, um, you know, a recommendation to move forward with the current agenda bill without fully understanding the funding implications, so I would be okay with moving it to full council um, in February, but I, I'm not at this point comfortable saying that's the right way to fund it, and so I, mm -hmm. I can't go with the agenda bill as written. Okay, um, so President Martz, do you have? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I don't know, I don't know if, uh, in, in how we refer something back from committee, if we can just say, you know, the committee referred it back to full council with a request for additional information mm -hmm. without saying the, the committee recommended approval of option X, right? I, I don't know if it, if that's a different, if that's a change without a difference, I don't know. But I think that clearly this meeting is being recorded and the administration will understand if that's the, if that's the recommendation of the three of us. I'm sure they'll, they'll figure out a way to, to say it so that it doesn't sound like we gave it three big thumbs up. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about other alternatives. I know that we could also um, refer it back to council infrastructure for more consideration with that new information. Um, I think though that would affect the timeline for the, for the improvements to the streetscape. Um, I, I mean, I would support just council having, okay. once we find the answer to this, maybe we ask that an option um, be added you know, a uh, capital uh, improvement plan option be added to the bill. And then, you know, maybe it's a hopefully 10 minute conversation in full council as to, you know, I think the three of us like the details on this plan. We're just, we need to get resolution on the funding mechanism. Yeah, I, 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 I can't speak for you, you, but I'll speak for me. I think it's uh, something we need to do. It's something we said we were gonna do, um, but the bill is written right now, has enough, there's just uncertainty. So, and I think it's well within our committee's purview to rec um, to refer back to, or to send it back to full council without a recommendation, and I, and, and I guess that's kind of where my my head is at, given that I think you know, the chair Hunt is correct. The you know there are other options that are not on the table that we need um, to understand better before we can do that. But I don't think it's a particularly onerous conversation at the full council. 
Um, and I think that we, you know, having gone through the, the material and the idea and the design and all that, it's the right thing. It's really a question of funding that we're really wrestling. And I think that President Martz is correct. Um, I like calling you President Martz, by the way. I think it sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we can dispatch this very quickly at full council, and I don't want to bring it back to CIC um, just because I think if you really do have a six month implementation horizon, you're starting to get into the dead of summer, and I don't want to be planting big old trees in the dead of summer. So, so again, when, when you see this, when this comes back to full council, we will have a, um, a complete uh, discussion, explanation of the funding mechanism and why it's proposed for the way it is. And so you will have that, uh, the whole entire council will have that. And, and an option for uh, uh, treating it as part of the capital improvement? Yes. With options, yes. Okay, um, so I will make a motion based on this discussion, which is um, not the, it's not the administration's recommendation, um, but it will be the recommendation coming out of this committee, which is to recommend that this be referred back to the full council with the explanation regarding the funding strategy and an option for treating this as part of the capital um, improvement discussion. Yes. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And the last item for this evening is um, project updates, and this will be presented by Kurt Seaman, engineering manager. Thank you, Council Member Hunt. We're, uh, you have in, I think, in your packet, the um, January 2019 uh, project updates, and I, I'm going to ask um, Bob to jump in here as well for his portion of these. I just wanted to go through a, a couple of our projects and, and highlight the progress on a couple of those, and of course, answer any questions you may have on any other ones. So in the transportation section, uh, a quick update on the first project there, which is the state park entrance study. So this project relates to the improvements, signal improvements at uh, 12th and uh, SR 900, that's in the vicinity of, of the other city hall by the uh, T-Mobile uh, Holiday Inn intersection there at 900. And we have been working with the state and, and continue to plan to work with them. As you know, they are looking at um, possible revisions to the state park and uh, possible revisions to their entrance. Um, we continue to plan to work with them. We also uh, realize the importance of that project to, to us, to making improvements at that intersection. And also uh, it is a uh, commitment that the city's made uh, jointly with Costco. So we need to move forward on that project. And so I think we're quickly getting to the point where um, I think the state's, uh, the state's plans are still a ways out there and it may, uh, it may be that we'll begin design here on that project this year. That's, that's currently our plan. So just that's briefly the highlight on that one. And um, so we, this is not news to you. We presented the, um, the, Gil the um, Newport Way from Gilman to, that's not labeled correctly, I don't think. But we presented Newport Way to you on uh, council work session. So, uh, oh, I'm looking at the wrong project, I apologize. Uh, the Newport Way project, we presented uh, that to you at council work session. We have uh, in the process of complete value engineering um, analysis on that project. Uh, a lot of interesting things uh, preliminarily have come out of that. Um, ways to perhaps construct the roadbed, uh, um, different ways to think about wall construction, those kinds of things. So once we get that final report, we're going to be reviewing that and uh, possibly making some recommendations from that work that will affect uh, that project and uh, 
it's, it's value, right? So it's not just about money, it's, it's about creating a, uh, a better project, a better, a more valuable project. But there, that was a worthwhile, uh, about a week long effort and we got a lot of good information out of that. And then uh, I'm not sure where you all are on the uh, 43rd um, signal discussion, but we're, uh, we on our end are moving forward to finalize the design on that, so we will be uh, ready f with the final design and ready to um, bid that project this spring pending uh, council final decision on that project. And uh, the other project of note that I know is uh, especially important to the residents of South Cove and that part of town is the um, is this Northwest Sammamish Road Pinch Point project as you know uh, the state's moving forward with their auxiliary lanes and wall project. Um, they're working on that this year and probably into next. We are beginning our design, planning to begin our design on that project here in the next quarter so that we have a design. We have very limited right away there uh, to work in. I think it's, a, it's about 40 feet. So. Uh, it's not going to be a. It's not going to be a spectacularly wide, have everything type of project, but it it will have um, lanes in both directions, bike lanes in both directions, and sidewalks. So uh, we're beginning. Or we'll soon be beginning uh, design on that project. So that's uh, those. I think are the projects I wanted to highlight with you all. And then of course. Uh, I suppose the elephant in the room is the 62nd project, and that is opening on January 28th. It's a Monday, so we're uh, finishing the, placing the last finishing touches on that project and look forward to having that road open here very soon. So that's the transportation side. I don't know, Bob, if you wanted to highlight any of the uh, utility projects. No. <clears throat> Tony in the room, I'd like to give him a, sh a shout out because we have two things out the bid already this year. Uh, a small portion of our 2019 water main rehabilitation, something we couldn't get done a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and then I, he got out the 2019 sewer main rehabilitation, all focused on South Cove, I think, right? And uh, they're out to bid in by mid-January. So the best time to get bids is now. Uh, and we're trying to, we did a pretty good job last year too, keeping most of the utility jobs under budget. Another <clears throat> exciting thing that you've been asking about in the past is that uh, we've got the new stormwater senior engineer, Alan Quinn, on board. Tomorrow he's getting out a RFQ for uh, consultant help on the Lower Isquah Creek uh, stream rehabilitation and riparian enhancement. Uh, we also We'll be seeing the final grant. It's taken years to get this from Department of Ecology to partially finance our stormwater master plan activities, which will begin and be managed by Alan uh, in the near, very near future. So February is when we're going to have grant acceptance by by the council. So that's my seconds or plus or minus. Thanks. Thank you. Any questions? And I, I just wanted to. I, I just wanted to, just one thing really quick. I think I. I just wanted to be clear on the on the two projects. So Newport Way is the project that we're completing the value engineering analysis. Gilman, of course, is the project that we just uh, shared with you the um, the updates and the and the framework on. Uh, recently, so I think I may have gotten those confused. But I want to clarify that. So I just want to speak for everybody who lives in the city of Issaquah and how excited we all are about 62nd Street opening up and um, how that is going to be um, welcome relief. So thank you for all the hard work you all did in making that happen. And then, Tony, thank you for all the work you've done around the water system. It's, uh, you know, this doesn't happen by itself. Great, um, thank you, and yes, very exciting about uh, 62nd Street opening. And I also wanted to say thank you for um, the description and purpose column in our updates. I think it'll help us keep track of, of um, what all the projects are without having to 
to look around, and um, it also gives insight into why we're doing what we're doing, which is helpful. So thank you for that. Um, and I don't have any, do we have anything else? Okay. So um, the next meeting of the Issaquah City Council um, Infrastructure Committee will be February 21st, 2019 here in Council Chambers. And with that, we are adjourned.